doctrine in the first half and then telling us what we need to do with it. I mean, he, and almost all of his epistles or his letters, he does, he does that because we're all pretty good at learning what to do, but not so much at doing it, right? It's like, I know, I know what to do, and then when you come to do it, it's like, no, I don't want to do it. I know it, but I don't want to do it. And, and whether we realize it or not, you know, there's a whole lot going on in this world. You know, this world moves at a pretty fast clip, especially with social media and just the exposure to all the news feeds. They could drive you crazy. I mean, if you don't block them and you get sucked into them. And there's a whole lot going on in this letter. And in the Bible, it's not just words for knowledge. It, it's anchored for the soul through wisdom and understanding. This book is about connection, connecting to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And, and so that we won't become detached if you're paying attention. You know, Hebrews, take the more earnest heed to the things you've heard lest you drift away. You know, when Bruce is reading the psalm today and it says, God will trade our hands for war and people are like, we're in a battle? Yeah, well, Moses says in Exodus 15 in his prayer that the Lord is a warrior. He's a man of war. It's not that we're defenseless. You know, we, Jesus came the first time as the lamb. He's been here and gone. Guess what? He's coming back the next time as the lion. You know, it's the judgment time. And people say, well, I, I, just, I just don't think that'll happen. Guys, it's going to happen. It's prophecy. It's, it's, it's going to happen, and we know that. Hebrews 6, 19 through 20, we've been through this. We're going to do a little review quick because it's been a while. But it says this hope we have, or this belief, as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The anchor of our soul, think of this, what's the anchor of our soul? It's heaven and a home. It's our hope. Heaven. Heaven is our anchor. And you say, how can that be? It's, I'm not there. Guys, heaven on earth, we're here. God is in us. That's our hope going home. And, and, it, and it's, we're told that so we don't drift away. Warren Wearsby in his commentary in, called uh, Be Complete said, In the final two chapters of Colossians, Paul moves into the practical application of doctrines he's been teaching. And as we go through these guys, some of these are tough. You're like, well, I might not be very good at that. Well, as long as we're aware of it, we can get better at it. I, th I saw malice in here, like you, you get rid of malice, and it's, it's wishing evil on others. And I told my wife, I said, we were practicing malice when we were hoping Tom Brady would lose last weekend. <laughs> I, I, that was the definition. I'm like... There was malice in my heart towards them. I mean, I, that, it's true. I guess I just don't like him. I used to like him until he came out of retirement, but that's another story. <laughs> you can see I still have a little malice I'm working on in my heart. But he says, after all it does, it, 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 all, after all, it does little good if Christians declare and defend the truth but fail to de demonstrate it in their lives. There are some Christians who will defend the truth at the drop of a hat, right? We'll defend the truth but their personal lives deny the doctrines they profess to love. Titus 1.16 says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. We must keep in mind that the pagan religions of Paul's day said little or nothing about personal morality. They, there wasn't a lot going on with morale, as far as morals. A worshiper could bow down before an idol, put his offering on the altar, and go back to live the same old life of sin. You know, they could do that. Here's my offering, God. It didn't mean anything. They just kept doing what they did. What a person believed had no direct relationship with how he behaved. And no one would condemn a person for his behavior. But the Christian faith brought a whole new concept into pagan society. What we believe has a very definite connection with how we behave. Yeah, what we believe with how we behave. After all, faith in Christ means being united to Christ, and if we share his life, we must follow his example. He cannot live in us by his Holy Spirit and per permit us to live in sin. And he can't. When the Holy Spirit's in us, we can still sin, but there's that conviction. There should be. 
and there's forgiveness for sin. So Paul connects doctrine with duty in this section. But before we get too far into this, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for your love, your word, your patience with us. As we go through these first 11 verses of chapter 3, teach us, Lord, and help us. Because we're seeing that we're going to be putting things off and taking things on and what we should do and there's certain commands. Um, help us figure that all out, Father. Because um, we're fallen in nature. And Lord, in you, we're, made, um, we're reconciled, but we still need your help. So Lord, just thank you for being a father who cares for us and loves us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. I don't know if I have this up there. In the Old Testament... Did that, am I jumping ahead? I don't know. And did I put it out? No? There it is. This is from Alistair Begg. I came across it. It says in the Old Testament, think of this. As, we, as you read through your Bible in the Old Testament, Christ is predicted. That's why it's important to read all of it. In the Gospels, he's revealed. In Acts, he's preached. In the Epistles, he is explained. And in Revelation, he is expected. Guys, that's what we get when we read the Bible. That's what we get in our lives as we see what God has for us. Now, the purpose of Colossians was to combat errors in the church and to show that the believers have everything they need in Christ. Remember, people were bringing in this other teaching, this Gnosticism. It was Jesus plus. You know, oh, you have Jesus, but you need this. You know, mix a little of Jesus with this, and everything will be okay. It doesn't work that way. All we need is Christ. All we need is Jesus. People say, well, is it that easy? It is that easy. It is that easy. It, becoming a Christian is the easiest part. Living it, that's the hard part. Harder part. I don't want to say it's hard, but guys, it's difficult. What do we say? The Lord is a warrior. Why? Read Ephesians 6. He gives us armor to put on. It never says take it off. It never says take it off. Paul wrote this letter. It's one of his prison letters, along with Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon. Philemon, I, you, know, you, you know what I'm trying to say. I'm going to look up the right pronunciation of that next week. It's just a strange looking word. It's written to the church at Col Colossae, a city in Asia Minor, and all believers everywhere about AD 60. And, and Paul had never visited this city, but we know there were a couple of his, his um, disciples that did, Epaphras and other converts from Paul's missionary travels. And like we said, the church had been infiltrated by religious relativism. And what's that? It's like, whatever you, whatever you want goes. You know, whatever feels good to you. What, what, do we see a lot of that today? Oh, yeah, we see a lot of that today. Too much of it. And you see it in the churches. You know, whatever you see it in the... It's just, you just see it everywhere right now. But the point is that Paul confronts these false teachings and affirms the sufficiency of Christ. If he's sufficient for us, why look anywhere else? Why look anywhere else? And there was a crisis, and you say, well, why is this such a big deal? A crisis had occurred that was about to destroy the ministry of the church. I mean, you, you, when you start watering down Christ, when you start taking him out of context, when you start adding things, guys, it'll destroy the church. It will destroy the church. What is the church? The church is the called out ones, called out from the world. That's what the church is. We meet here as a body of believers in a church, but we're all called out ones. We're part of that body, the called, the called out of this world. The key verse is in Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. How do we know we're complete in him? The Bible says so. Who is the head of all principality, rule, and authority, and power. And the special feature of this epistle is that Christ is presented as having absolute supremacy and soul sufficiency. Absolute supremacy and soul sufficiency. And the Colossian church was probably about five years old when Paul wrote this. And it was predominantly Gentile in its membership, although there was a very large Jewish population there. So a lot of the Gentiles, and, and, but even though a large Jewish, Jewish presence. So the blueprint in this letter is Paul clearly teaches that, and I, and I love this, Christ has paid for sin. 
He's paid the price. He's reconciled us to God. And Christ gives us the pattern and the power to grow spiritually. Right? He gives us the pattern. And sometimes we're like, I don't like that pattern. You know, it's almost like if you're clothes shopping, guys are like, I see guys rolling their eyes like, oh no. <laughs> it's like, it's like that doesn't go together. We don't like the pattern. You know, it's, it's you know, and, and that's, right? We don't put this with a different colored checkered pants, right, guys? We, we know that better. But it's, guys, it's, it, there's, but this fits. God gives us the pattern, and sometimes we're just like, we don't want to do it. But the explanation is, guys, our, our conduct should match our faith, and, and, it, it, and it should be taking the right actions because Christ is the exact likeness of God. When we get to know Him as we get to know Him, He's the exact likeness of God, and when we learn what He is like, we see what we need to become, right? He's our, he's our, he, when we see what He's like, we know what we should become. And don't get discouraged in the process because you're like, what, what am I supposed to be like? God, you know, your kids would be like, what do you expect me to be perfect? Like God? And I could fill in a blank. I'm not going to go there. I could say stuff that would really get me in trouble, but I won't. But, it's, but no, we, we just want you to follow to the best of your ability what you should do. And that's what we do as Christians, right? We walk this out. We're being sanctified. We're learning. We're living. We're learning. We live and we learn. We say things we shouldn't do. That's why we go to a brother and say, you know, forgive me that I said that. You know, I mean, and that's what, that's what it's about. God's much more concerned about our honesty before him and our attitude of grace and mercy towards others. Aha, uh-huh. you're like, there, there it is. Then he is about us doing everything correctly. It, it's, it's, it's knowing it and exercising it. And in the start is, since Christ is Lord over all creation, we should crown him Lord of our lives. Since Christ is the head of the body, his church, we should nurture that vital connection to him. And, and God is very good at providing the outline, the purpose, the reason for being here. I mean, he's, I, I don't know about you guys, but um, this is our heaven on earth, and he's given me more than enough reasons to be here and, and, and what to do what I want to do. You know, it, it, you really can't get away from it. I met a guy in jail this week, a guy that I've known for a while. He's back in jail. And, 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 and he's a smart guy. You say, well, how smart is he? He's been in jail. You know, but it's, he said, I'm 33. I've been incarcerated or in and out of trouble for the last 20 years since he's 13. And he's holding his Bible and he goes, I cannot get away from God convicting me and speaking to me right now he goes everywhere i open god's talking to me everything i do he's talking to me and i said he's finally got you where he wants he goes i know and his tears coming down his eyes you know and that but but guys do we want to go 20 years of running from the lord because you can't get away from him you know you can't get away from him why would we but when we don't know christ that's the only life we know so it seems to make sense but once you know him you look back and you're like, I don't ever want to do that again. Not that we're perfect, but we, we live that, the lifestyle we came from and the one that we're living for now. And that's what makes it so understandable for us. I, I've read this before, this introduction about the anchor in the boat, but I want to read it again because it's, it's so, it's, it's, it, it just puts this into perspective how we need to stay connected to Christ so we won't drift. In the fall of 1992, Michael Plant He was a popular American yachtsman. He set sail from the U.S. for a solo transatlantic crossing to France, and his vessel was state-of-the-art sailboat. It was called the Coyote. The Coyote was second to none in its equipment. Its hull was made of the finest materials, and its sophisticated electronics included an emergency guidance and tracking system that was linked directly to a satellite. Michael Plant had everything he needed the expertise, experience, equipment for a successful voyage to France, but 11 days into the voyage, radio contact with the coyote was lost. Initially, the radio silence raised a little alarm because Michael was known to be independent, and most people suspected that rough seas were consuming his time. Once the storms passed and the seas became calm again, everyone believed that Michael would radio and say that all was well. 
But after a few more days passed with no word from him, a search party was launched. It was true that Michael had encountered rough seas and a severe storm. But when the coyote was built, an 8,000-pound weight was bolted to its keel, making it almost impossible to capsize. Yet when the boat was finally found, it was floating upside down and there was no trace of its captain. Nobody knows when or how or why, but the 8,000-pound weight somehow broke loose, rendering the boat unstable, and one large wave was all it took. And guys, the world comes at us in waves. What a tragic irony. Millions of dollars in state-of-the-art equipment with the finest and most experienced sailor at the helm was all for nothing because of a simple problem that occurred below the surface. Something all the satellites in the world couldn't fix. In a similar way, a person's faith can look legitimate on the outside, Above the waterline, but if that very same faith is not bolted to the person and work of Jesus Christ, he will have no chance of completing the journey. No chance. And why? Because as the one and only God-man, Jesus alone is incapable of taking the penalty for our sins and anchoring us to the Father through faith. Jesus himself, Jesus made this clear in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And if we anchor that, to our lives, anchor it. You won't get capsized. And like I said, the world comes at us in waves. You're like, if you just got through a problem, let me tell you, there's another one coming. Because waves just keep coming. You know, if you ever sat on the ocean, they just keep coming. Or, you know, they just keep coming. And and that's what the way life is. Not to hurt us or harm us, but we're going to see to keep us anchored as we go through this chapter. But somehow the Colossian believers began to drift. And you remember Jesus passed away in 33 AD. This was written 27 years later. You're thinking, well, that wasn't much time. It wasn't. It wasn't much time. But Paul had to stop this drift because it was about to destroy the um, church and its people. Now, chapters 1 and 2 was about what Christ had done. Three and four is what Christians should do, what we should do. And it starts with this this statement. I'm going to read the first four verses and then kind of go back. If then, there's the choice. That's almost the last choice we get in this chapter. If then you, and and I've, I've seen how many times it says you and your in here. If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on those things above, not on earth, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden or deposited in Christ, with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, interesting, isn't it? He's our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, If then, we're given a choice. But think of this, not only have the Colossians believers been freed from sin, they've also turned to a new life. They have a new life, leaving behind old ways, habits, vices, interests, and sins. Guys, we we are to partake, and I have it up, to partake of the table God has set for us, right? It's It's like he set the best thing, and we look at it sometimes and go, I don't want to eat that, you know? He's like, I'm giving you the best thing. I'm giving you what you want. And you're like, no, I don't want that. I need something else. You know, it's, and you're, and, but he's got the best things for us. And it's, be, and it's not beyond our understanding. It's not beyond our understanding. You know, participation in the res- resurrection of Christ has ethical or right or decent implications. And the big ones are, as believers, we're not to seek the things above. Guys, we're not to seek those things above and it makes sense seen through his eyes you're like well this world doesn't make any sense well look through it through his eyes you know i don't know if i shared this with you but i shared it with a couple of the studies and people um you know i've I've been i've been just praying to god for certain things and and i'm like god what am i missing and you know his answer was me i'm like "Hmm, that's a pretty simple answer you know, I'm trying to figure all these things out, and I'm like, God, what am I missing? He goes, me. You know, all the things you think you know and all the things you want to do, and you're like, God, I got this. You know, I got it. And he's like, I'm your anchor. You know, he's, he's like, I'm right here. 
You know, it's like when we okay our plans and we're like, God, are you okay with that? And he's like, I'll take you to the book of James chapter 4, or is it 5? You know, the plans you make without me aren't that good of a thing. But here we are, if then you were raised, look at these, you, we, we're going to see these words seek and set. And guys, you know what these are in the Greek? They're not suggestions, they're commands. <laughs> seek, seek those things which are above, or be, make it a habit to exercise them in your mind so you understand. It's this seek and desire, focus habitually. It, it's, 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 it's this habit of focusing. Okay, God, what do you want me to do, you know? What do we, we know that God's above. Why do we, why do we look above? Because he's in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. Why do we know that heaven's above? Because the Bible tells us that. They ascended. They went up into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And set, sorry, set means to exercise the mind, to interest oneself. And so, so we're seeking and we're setting. We're seeking when we're setting. And it takes practice and exercise and commitment, doesn't it? Does this just happen overnight? No, we have to have practice, exercise, and commitment. And we have to be, be caring and concerned through obedience and be careful because we need to be connected. And guys, when we're connected, we will be complete. And the seek and set is not an optional thing. It's not an optional thing. Now, how, how are we supposed to... Um, I have this at the end, but I'm going to go over it now. I heard a commentator... Um, Oh, who was it? John Corson. How are we to do this? How are we to do this seeking and setting? He said, God will do three things for us. He will, um, we're supposed to put our what in heaven? Our treasure, right? Make sure your treasure is in heaven. Make sure you're putting it there. Where your heart is, there your treasure is. Whatever we love, hold in our heart, that's our treasure. Give it to God. That's that's where our heart will be, in heaven. And, and then it's, um, what did he have? I have it at the end. Then we're, um, he does tra um, transfers for us. Oh, no, I know what it is. Sorry, I'm skipping one. The second one is trials. So we have treasure and trials, daily trials. God gives us daily trials to keep our vision above. You say, well, that's not nice. <laughs> it, it's a father saying, I, these things are coming to you but give them to me and I'll work through them so you keep your eyes above. You know, God, why is this happening? Help me through this. You know, the, the prayer should be, oftentimes we're like, God, get rid of this. Why don't you just say, God, help me through this? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You know, I just, um, I've been praying um, for widows lately and we had that prayer today and it's a long list, longer than I want it to be. As I go through all the people that I've done funerals for over the last year, I'm like, just in a lot of them that we know, I'm like, that's a lot of people. And, and, it, and it's, so keep, keep, you know, the widows in prayer. And then here's something that goes along with this. How does God keep our eyes in heaven? He, does, he works in transfers. What does that mean? He transfers people in our lives out of this life into heaven. And you say, well, that's not nice again. But guys, we're not living here forever. You know, that's the important, and, it, and it's that missing. You know, it's that, where are they? You know, just with Saran, we know Craig was a Christian, Craig's in heaven, you know? You know, Craig, brother, he's up there. You know, I always think of Ted. I have Ted one song, I like, now I'm home, and I'm thinking, I always tell Ted, you know, um, I want you to sing that at my service, and then Ted's probably thinking, well, I gotta live longer than you. And Ted, if I'm not here, just to be singing it when I come up to heaven. <laughs> I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's those, it, it just, you just think, you know, it's this transfers. It's, it's as, we, as we live and we leave and we breathe and we go up, it's that treasure, that those, um, those daily trials and that transfer, that's how we seek the things above. And it, you say, well, it doesn't sound that simple, but I think it can be. Matthew 6.33 said, seek first the kingdom of God. You know, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness <clears throat> and all these things shall be added to you. And, and there are certain things that must be first, never second. And one is seeking his kingdom first. And <clears throat> you say, what are all these things that are added to us? 
<clears throat> everything he brings into our lives so we don't have this drifting, so we don't have all these things happening. You know, I, I mention Isaiah um, 6 or 118 about reasoning, and I just want to read Isaiah. You don't have to turn there. Isaiah um, chapter 118, verse 20, where he says, Come, let us reason together. Because I was just, I was, I was reading that the other day, and I like, well, this, <clears throat> just 18, 19, and 20, Isaiah says, Come now, let us reason together, or make clear and settle, decide and judge or prove. Says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, think of this, this is what we were, they shall be white as snow. They shall be. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, here's the seeking in, the, in this, this, this just coming to Christ, this obedience. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Guys, in Christ, if we decide to, we have so many things. We have so many things. And guess what? The world hates that. They say, you Christians. Sorry, I'm turning back to Colossians. You know, like, you Christians. You know how many times we've heard that? I mean, you can say any other word in the world, but if you start talking about Jesus, everybody just flips out. Why? Because it's the truth. And we're, next, next week I'm going to share a couple things as we finish chapter 3. Um, C.S. Lewis in his book, Not the Tame Lion, talking about um, heaven and hell and how truth and it's just it's just really neat but <clears throat> i'm already drifting all right so i won't get off on that but how is this possible it's like if we choose of uh, verses three and four you know dead to sin it says you're dead to sin <clears throat> and we're hidden with christ you know we are deposited in him we're deposited in him that we and we don't have an excuse it, it, this means your life is deposited with deposited with christ who is in intimate relationship with God. Um, and, and, and to me, this is serious stuff. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. It's back, it's back to the left. And I'm having you turn there because it's, um, it's really a close book, and it's really neat. I want to read chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Because Paul, <clears throat> in another one of his epistles, he, he tell, he, he's talking about grace through faith, and in chapter 2 of Ephesians, in verse 1, he says, and, and you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who's the prince of the power of the air? Satan. And the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedient, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and we're by nature we were by all nature children of wrath just as the others but God in verse 4 this is our testimony who is rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved us even when we were dead we were lifeless in trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Isn't it? It's just what Paul's talking about. It's like we're dead. We're dead to him. And now we get to appear in glory. You say we're hidden with Christ in God. In verse 4, when Christ is our life appears, he's our life, then you will also appear with him in glory. What does that mean? His magnificence. All will see. All will see. Interesting thing. In Matthew 17, 4, and I never, I never caught this before. In the transfiguration, you know, Peter, John, Peter, John, and um, why can't I think of you? Help me out here, the inner three. James. They were up in a transfiguration, and you know, he, and Jesus is up there, he's white. I mean, like they've never seen him before, and God's speaking, the Holy Spirit's there. And it says in Matthew 17, 4, Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. That's all he said. He just says, it is good. I get God bumps thinking that because God's working on me, this word good. You know, in the word good, you think, I, we want everything to be great. But what does he say? I mean, God's they never beheld his glory like this. You know, uh, the prophets are there. And he, and he says, Lord, it is good 
for us to be here. Why? Because they were saying, seeing the magnificence of God. And, and I was doing a word search I was sharing in Sunday school, this word good, and it just means pleasant to behold. And guys, God created the earth and it was good. He didn't say great. And he uses the word great and awesome in the Bible. I think Psalm 47 says, the Lord is awesome, 47.1. You know why? Why, doesn't, why? why does he just say good? Because that's all that is needed. It's sufficient. And that's what they're saying here is when we're walking with Christ, sometimes, sometimes in life we expect all these great things, right? Well, you know what? Those of us who have worked a long time in life, you get up, you go to work, you come home, you're tired, and you do it the next day and the next day and the next day. But you know why? That's what God wants us to do. That's what we're here for. We're here to work. We do other things in the process. But you know what? We need to learn that that's good. That's a good thing. And we can be, and it's just good. You'll have good days. You'll have bad days. Great days, awesome days. Other days, barely days you can get through. But you know what? It'll be good with God. Now, Verse 5, things that should not be among believers, 5 through 9, slaying the earthly things. Therefore, remember, we're going to see that. Therefore, in verse 5, therefore, in verse 12, when we come back, remember when you see a therefore, you have to ask yourself why it's therefore. But what it does is it looks back and it brings back everything that we just went over. It, it goes over and it pulls it back. Therefore, put to death your members, which are on earth. And what are these? fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. These are the names of the central sins. And then covetousness is added. And why covetousness? Covetousness. It's, you know what that is? It's always wanting more. You shall not covet. You say, well, that's number 10. You do that one, it destroys all the other ones. It feeds into them. You always want more. You know, it's never enough. It's never enough. And then it, it, it couples it up with idolatry. But you know what? Put to death your members, your limbs. It means put to death your members or limbs. And, and we must not toy with sin or seek merely to contain it. Guys, it says we have to put it to death. You know, you have to put it to death. Because you have to. It'll destroy you. I'm, 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 I'm listening to the um, Shackleton adventure to the Antarctica and they were killing seals and penguins to eat, and out of the ice came this leopard seal, and I'm thinking, it's 12 feet long and weighs like 800 pounds or so, or 1,200, and they had to kill that thing. Guess why? It would have killed them. And you're like, a seal? Yeah. They said it was 12 feet long. Guys, that's what sin is. If you're like, oh, that's a pretty seal. Now, that sin's not too bad. You have to put it to death because the wages of sin is death. And we have to deprive evil of its power because there's no room for it. I remember, you know, I always think of Genesis chapter 4, 7. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. And desire is for you. But look what it says. But you should rule over it. You should rule over it. I, I saw something by Billy Graham. Maybe you saw it on, on the internet. When Satan knocks, Billy Graham said, I send Jesus to answer the door. <laughs> Isn't that something? It's, it's like when you're getting hit with temptation, go like, Lord, you get that. Answer that because I, I know what's going to happen if I open it. I, I love that. Billy Graham. When, I could just hear him saying, I'm not going to do my imitation. It, <laughs> I haven't practiced it enough. <laughs> but guys, we've already died with Christ, so the instruction involves putting into practice what is already a spiritual reality. It's already a reality. We just have to do it. And when you're dead to things, you can't participate, right? You can't participate. We shouldn't participate. And Scripture not only proves itself, our living does as well, and we realize what is good and bad. What to do and not to do and the power to overcome lies in Christ alone. That's one of the reasons why people, people say, well, if we're, if we're believers and we're going to heaven, why do we have to live here on earth? It's so what we, we, we learn to do these things and people see them and they see the difference they make in our lives and, and how Christians relate to, to life, death, and suffering and all those things. You know, we're that living example for Christ. Now, one thing in idolatry, it's anything that replaces devotion to God and we're not to dwell on things that, um, 
there's certain things that aren't wrong in themselves, like worried about, you know, housing, jobs, careers, and ambitions, but can go wrong should they become priorities in our lives. If you work too much, right? Then your job or that becomes more important than Christ and your family. Now, the sons of disobedience, look at verses 6, um, six through 8. Because of these things, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. So, the sons of disobedience, those who fail to listen and who routinely and obstinately disregard God's precepts. So when we go over these things, guys, it's not that Christians, we don't do it, because I said, you know, when we look at verse 8, I was practicing malice against Tom Brady. It means that you're habitually doing it. You're making a routine out of these, like they are part of who you are. And, and, and it says in, in Ephesians 5, 5, for this you know, there's... That no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. People might say, well, does that mean if I do that, I have no inheritance? It means if you make a habit of it, then you have to really check your allegiance to who Christ is in your life. And think of this. Disobedience, a life without God, empties everything of its meaning. It empties everything of its meaning. When you have this disobedient lifestyle, it just empties your life. It just takes it away. It just, and, and a lot of times, as, as an unbeliever, you don't realize it because you're just used to that lifestyle. But it's amazing what we can get used to. I mean, <laughs> it's really amazing. Now, verse 8 is the social sins. And, and we're going to start with anger, wrath, and malice. And those are sins of a bad attitude. You know, A lot of these are similar. Wrath is spontaneous anger. A malice, like I said, is, is ill will towards other and anger. I think we understand that. But these, these first three are sins of a bad attitude. But now you yourselves are to put off completely all these, all these anger, wrath or rage, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge, according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free. And I love this, and we'll get to it. But Christ is all and in all. I love that. There's a little more partaking for the Christian, and we're to put off these things. And next week, we get to see the things we get to put on. But Think of this. This is, James, this is echoed by James in James 1.21. So get rid of all uncleanness and the rampant, and this is the amplified version, get rid of all uncleanness and the rampant outgrowth of wickedness and in a humble, gentle, modest spirit receive and welcome the word which implanted and rooted in your hearts contains the power to save your souls. And putting off in verse 9, putting off of the old self and putting on the new draws on the metaphor of clothing, which was common in the ancient world. And clothing was seen as divine. It defined a person's status, right? It defined a person's status. So removing the old self means that believers will no longer live in their former ways and the new self is renewed according to, according to Christ. And, and, and why lies? Because the intent is to, de to de deceive for personal gain. You know, why lie if you're, not, you're being deceptive for personal gain? Who's the master of lies? Satan. Yeah, it's important stuff. And sometimes we just don't want to tell the truth, but you have to. You know, it's certain questions that should not be asked, they're unfair. I'll leave it at that. But think of this, verse 10. We're just wrapping this up, guys. Verse 10. Renewed. This word means to grow up in knowledge. And Paul talks about not being babes in the word anymore in 1 Corinthians. But here it means to grow up. Grow up in knowledge according to the image of him. Not according to us, but grow up in the knowledge. The new man is constantly being renewed or developed until he attains mature knowledge of the God who created him. 
The more a believer knows and understands of God, the more they will be like God in character and conduct. Guys, read and learn. Read and learn. Listen and learn if that's the way you learn. There's different ways of learning. Listen, write, learn. But guys, always be pursuing Him. Always be. Always be reading His Word. There's so much in here. And think of this. The Gospel overcomes all cultural barriers. That's what we see in in verse 11. Uniting believers in Christ. And the Greeks typically divided the world into two groups, Greek and barbarian. You know, that's what they did. You're either for us or against us. Either we're one of us or you're a barbarian. You know, that it was pretty easy for them, but I guess they had a lot of enemies. And the Jews divided in the world and Jew and Gentile, circumcision and uncircumcision. But in the church, there's no distinctions. And, and, and why? Because Christ is all in all. He's all, he is all and in all. And that's the emphasis of this letter. Now, a couple of verses in Romans, and then I'm going to end this. Romans 8.29 and Romans 12.2. Romans 8.29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Now, I'm going to read the Amplified of 12.2. A verse many of you are familiar with, but just listen to this. Do not be conformed to this world or this age, fashioned after and adopted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed or changed by the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideals and its new attitudes. And here it is. So that you may prove for yourselves. Think of that. This process, we're we're proving this to ourselves. What is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in the sight for you? So as we're doing these things, we, we're, it's almost as if we're unknowingly proving to ourselves the existence of God. It's almost as if when you do something you don't, that God doesn't say, aha, he just says, now you know more of who I am. You know, And that's why we're to put off the old completely and put on the new. Now, be complete is the, this is, the emphasis is on the believer's relationship with Christ. And Christ, like we said, is presented as having absolute supremacy and soul sufficiency. I love what 1 John 4, 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Guys, we're not without power. He who is in us, the Holy Spirit, is greater than he who is in this world. Keep and set your mind on things above, the treasure, the daily trials, the transfers. And we need to read Colossians as a book for an embattled church in the first century and for its timeless truth because I, I really do believe uh, as a church and, a, and as a world, as we're, we're in for some tougher times coming up. You know, I, I really don't have to tell you that. I, I just think it's going to happen. Does that mean we should be worried? We should be concerned, but remember who's in charge. You know, we, 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 we know the end. And guys, if we're, if we're, I, I just think it's a blessing that we're partakers of it. You know, and God has set us here at this time to do what we can. Whatever that is. You know, we, we um, I was meeting with some people today, and it, or that last week, and it was, um, you know, we're discussing some, additions and, and subtractions and, and one of them said you know we need to just keep doing what God has said in front of each one of us and isn't that true it, what do what God has said in front of each one of us and know that he is your leader the head and the power source because Christ is central he's in control and our belief has to equal the behavior because, the, guys, if our belief equals our behavior as Christians, we're not going to drift. We're not going to drift because other Christians will let you know. We might not like it. You know, we might not like it. But a friend is the one who tells you when you're going off course and you've got stuff in your teeth and on your face and stuff like that. That's a true friend. And they do it in a somewhat lovingly way, not drawing everybody's attention to it. They kind of do the old Our wives are really good at that. We need that. 
But to the redeemed, Christ is all that is. He is everything. He is what matters most to them. And Christ is in all that is. He dwells in all believers. And guys, make sure you are connected with Him or anchored because that's what will make a difference in your life now and later. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You for what You do. There's so much in Your Word, Lord. Just help us keep it simple. We can't do all these things at once. But we can do a few of those things today. So Lord, help us work through these. Make us be more aware of them. And Lord, remember, you are all of this life and the life to come. Lord, we just thank you for who you are and how you work for us and in us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand up and Ted's going to lead us out. As they say, one for the road, which means a whole lot more now than it did before in my life.